Hello everyone, welcome back. This is the early Muslim expansion, as it says. Uh, I don't remember, this is maybe number 12. Still got my and there's my there's my boo boo. I was changing a blade out, and uh, the blade decided it wanted to dig into my finger. You can't see it, but oh, it was it was fun. Video caught you off guard. In the last two parts of the early Islamic expansion. A previously united movement began to fragment, with the seemingly unstoppable conquests of the Caliphate halted by outbreaks of internal conflict. Today, we return to our focus on the frontiers, in particular the North African holdings of the Byzantine Empire, as old conflicts reignite under the new Umayyad Caliphate, while the heirs of Rome struggle with internal conflicts of their own. Expanding just as rapidly as the Caliphate is our sponsor Raid Shadow Legends, the famous mobile game which this month celebrates its third birthday, and all this time they've been adding new stuff to it. Okay. Now we can okay the video, okay. ...was Constant II, who faced an increasingly dire situation on numerous fronts. In 655, he had commanded the fleet that met disaster at the Battle of the Masts, only narrowly escaping with his own life. Uthman's murder and the beginnings of the first fitna the following year might have seemed like an opportunity for Constans to avenge his previous defeats against a divided foe. But Constans's attention was primarily turned to the west, where the Slavs and Lombards threatened Byzantine holdings in Greece and southern Italy. Not only did these European threats prevent him from taking advantage of the Islamic civil war, but they also necessitated a rise in taxes in provinces such as Sicily and North Africa, and seizures of church assets in Italy, sparking discontent and resentment towards Constans among both the provincial populations and the court in Constantinople. This political turmoil was worsened by another sort of conflict in the capital, a growing religious schism dating back to the reign of Heraclius. Efforts to reconcile differences between the Armenian and Greek orthodoxies led to the creation of the Monothelite movement. A sort of religious compromise followed, which failed to sway the majority of the Byzantine populace. By Constance's reign, this movement, that had been intended to reconcile Armenian and Greek religious divides, had simply created new divides within the capital, with Constance's attempt to quell the schism by banning all discussion of the controversy, even forcing Pope Martin I into exile after his condemnation of monothelitism, only creating new enemies for the embattled emperor. In 663, Two years after the end of the first fitna and the renewal of Arab attacks into Anatolia, Constans abandoned Constantinople and its hostile court and moved the Byzantine capital to Syracuse in Sicily. Unfortunately, the move would not long forestall his downfall. After relocating the capital, Constans moved into Italy with all the forces the empire could muster, in hopes of defeating the Lombards and securing southern Italy. His efforts were foiled at every turn, however, with the Lombards defeating him in a series of battles and forcing him to withdraw in shame back to Syracuse, while his son and co-emperor Constantine IV kept order in Constantinople. His legitimacy tarnished, he was unable to prevent Armenia from falling back into Arab suzerainty, and despite its prominence as the seat of the Byzantine Empire, Sicily would suffer a devastating naval raid in 666, led by Abdullah ibn Qais, that saw huge amounts of plunder enriching Muawiyah in Damascus. Caliph Muawiyah, a veteran of the Battle of the Masts himself, and a staunch enemy of the Byzantines, was now making increasingly aggressive moves at sea with his expanded navy, with similar raids carried out on roads, while Arab fleets secured naval bases along Asia Minor's Mediterranean coast in preparation for a planned siege of Constantinople. Even among Constans' own subjects, he faced danger at every turn, and in 667 he was forced to contend with an Umayyad-backed rebellion by the turncoat Armenian general and would-be emperor Saborios, that briefly took control of much of Anatolia. 
The rebellion would soon come to naught after Saborius's accidental death in a riding mishap shortly before battle near Melitene. But this would not be the end of Constanze's woes, as Fadala ibn Ubaid, an experienced Muslim general who had briefly operated as a liaison and ally to Saborius, soon laid siege to Constantinople's Anatolian suburb of Chalcedon. Although they succeeded in capturing many prisoners, a lack of supplies and support caused this first siege attempt to flounder. In their original plan, they would have been operating in territory under the sway of their rebel ally, able to rely on local supply routes and bolstered by Saborius' own forces. Forced to operate alone in hostile territory, disease and hunger soon set in. Sucks. Little Caesar's Detroit-style deep dish that's actually from Detroit, with caramelized crispy cheese edges. Pizza, pizza. <laughs> I can't skip it. No music. No sound. And we're back. Disease and hunger soon set in, and the army was forced to withdraw, with even the arrival of reinforcements under Muawiyah's son, Yazid, failing to turn the tide. It does appear that the initial Arab intention was to return to besiege Constantinople proper the following year as a sizable garrison, 5,000 according to Theophanes the Confessor, was left behind in the captured fortress of Amorion to provide a forward base for a later attack. However, Amorion would be recaptured during the bitterly cold winter that followed, with a eunuch chamberlain named Andrew leading a force through the heavy snows that regained control of the fortress and put its garrison to the sword, delaying the planned attack on Constantinople and denying the Arabs their first major inland foothold in western Anatolia. This small victory was to be Constance's last, however, with the emperor not long outliving his would-be usurper. Constance II was struck on the head with a bucket and assassinated by one of his servants as he took his bath <laughs> early in 668 with further rebellion breaking out in Sicily as the conspirators You got hit on the head with a bucket? Come on, man. You got hit on the head with a bucket. Okay. In his murder, <laughs> acclaimed General Mazisius their emperor in opposition to Constantine IV. Oh, the young Constantine would thus be forced to confront both the rebels in Sicily and the still looming Arab attack on Constantinople in the first years of his solo reign. Of these two challenges, the rebellion of Mazesius would be the swiftest dealt with, though it would still leave the empire weakened in ways that would soon cause further disaster. Constantine called up troops from the embattled frontiers of North Africa and Italy, bringing an end to the rebellion in Sicily after seven months and ending its brief heyday as the empire's capital. With Constance's murder and Mazasius's acclamation so closely tied to the ongoing religious schism, the general failed to command widespread support in Sicily beyond the soldiers under his command or rally supporters beyond the island's shores. By the account of Theophanes the Confessor, even Mazasius himself had not wished to become emperor and had been chosen as a figurehead leader against his will on account of his good looks. But, however easily the rebellion might have been suppressed, the recalling of soldiers from North Africa did leave the Byzantine forces in Carthage far less able to resist the pressure of the Arabs in Tripoli, creating an opportunity for the conquest of the Maghreb, stalled since before the first fitna, to resume. 668 and 669 saw renewed Arab raids capture many thousands of prisoners from the remaining Byzantine territories in modern Tunisia, as the uneasy stalemate the two sides and their respective Berber allies had settled into broke down, with the continuing Arab presence in Anatolia further distracting the overstretched Byzantines from the defence of their frontier provinces. Meanwhile, despite Muawiyah's western focus and enmity towards the Byzantines, smaller conquests still continued apace along the former frontiers of the Sassanid Empire. In 670, Muhalab ibn Abi Sufra conquered Kabul and took at least nominal control of all of Khorasan, one of the only regions formerly under Persian domination to have remained outside of Arab control. And despite some staunch resistance from Turkic hill tribes, 
that nearly saw one force surrounded and wiped out during its return to Kabul. He also successfully penetrated the Khyber Pass to begin the first inland conquests into modern Pakistan, previous Muslim incursions into the Indian subcontinent having been limited to the more easily traversed coastal lowlands. Politically, some unrest still continued to flare up, as Muawiyah attempted to crack down on lingering support for Ali, with the respected general Hujja ibn Adi and several of his compatriots being executed for refusing to denounce the deceased caliph, an act shocking to most. Still, the next major prize for the largely unified caliphate and the single-minded focus that would define Muawiyah's later years as caliph was Constantinople, with the campaign to take it beginning in earnest in 672. A I got a stupid question. Is uh, Constantine the, and, and the, the, the father who's dead now, Constant, Constance, I already forgot the name. That's how important he was to this story. Are they naming themselves after Constantinople or is Constantinople named after them? Anyone know? Just curious. Okay. Massive Umayyad fleet was outfitted and launched, wintering in the naval bases prepared in Smyrna and Cilicia, while the Byzantines hurriedly constructed great biremes and dromons for the city's defense, equipped with a new and deadly anti-ship weapon, Greek fire. Uh-oh, Greek fire? With really? No one cares, come on. Great, no one cares. Let's get on with the video. With the coming of spring, the fleet embarked for Constantinople, clashing almost daily with Byzantine ships in the waters just south of the Dardanelles from April until September. Compared to the Battle of the Masts, which saw the Arab fleet score victory in a pitched battle between two massed fleets, the presence of Greek fire would have made any full fleet-on-fleet -fleet engagement near suicidal for the Arabs, despite the greater size of their navy, leaving it infeasible for the Umayyad fleet to attempt to break through the Dardanelles or bring its full force to bear against Constantinople. Under the command of Yazid, Umayyad armies were ferried to land to surround the city, but a lack of effective naval support made overcoming the city's formidable defences a truly daunting task. Though Arab forces under Yazid, Fadala and Abdallah ibn Qais did see success in various skirmishes in the surrounding region and in Crete, and were able to honour the passing of the venerable commander Abu Ayyub al-Ansari by pushing to the Theodosian walls themselves to bury him at their base. For five full years, the campaigning of the Umayyads failed to break through the Dardanelles and cut off Constantinople from supplies, while the Greek fire-equipped five years wow. ships inflicted mounting casualties with every engagement. Finally, ten years into Constantine's tumultuous reign in 678, flagging morale and a large rebellion of Mardite Christians and escaped slaves in the Nur mountain range north of Alexandretta forced Muawiyah to abandon the campaign, oh. the greatest military disaster the seemingly unstoppable caliphate had suffered since it had first exploded onto the world stage some four decades prior. Yet the successful defense did little to change the overall balance of power, with the struggling Romans still on the defensive against the still expanding Arabs. The following years would give a much needed, if brief, reprieve to the Byzantines, as Caliph Muawiyah's death in 680 was swiftly followed by a new period of turmoil and civil war. At the center of the new conflict was Muawiyah's attempt to secure the succession of his son Yazid when caliphs had been chosen by election prior to his reign. Yazid was indeed acclaimed as caliph in Medina, but when the governors and notables of the caliphate were summoned to give him their oaths of allegiance, two important figures refused to swear the oath, Hussein ibn Ali, son of Caliph Ali, and Abdullah ibn Zubayr, son of the Zubayr who had opposed Ali at the Battle of the Camel some 24 years prior. Despite the rivalry of their fathers, the two men were united in their opposition to Yazid and fled from Medina to Mecca to raise a rebellion against him. 
Offers of support soon arrived from Ali's former power base of Kufa, giving Hussein hope his murdered father's cause could be revived. A cousin of Hussein's, Muslim ibn Akil, was sent to Kufa ahead of Hussein and his party to determine the strength of their support in Kufa, and out of suspicion the offers might be a trap by Yazid or a local notable attempting to curry his favour. Upon his arrival, he found the offers of support genuine, and as many as 12,000 flocked to Muslim side to pledge their loyalty to Hussein. Upon receiving this news, Hussein departed Mecca to join his cousin in Kufa, a journey he would never complete. Despite his recent rocky succession to the throne, Caliph Yazid was determined to stamp out the rebellion before it could grow to challenge him, and upon learning that Kufa's governor, Noman ibn Bashir, had chosen to remain neutral and allow Hussein's supporters to gather, swiftly took matters into his own hands. Noman was transferred to a different province, with Yazid's loyal supporter Abaydallah ibn Ziyad replacing him and initiating a harsh crackdown on the growing rebel band, with Muslim ibn Akil and several of its other leaders being murdered and the demoralized rebels being scattered under intense pressure from local military forces. By the time Hussein received word of this disaster, he was already near today's Rifai, far from the safety of Mecca, with only a few supporters around him in increasingly hostile territory. Hussein might still have turned back and returned to Mecca at this point, but opinions among his supporters were divided, with some of his tribal supporters offering him sanctuary in the mountains of northern Najd, while many in his own family encouraged him to continue to Kufa and avenge his murdered cousin. Eventually, Hussein took the latter decision, and though many of his supporters deserted him, his march towards Kufa continued. Soon, at the plains of Karbala, his tiny band of supporters was chased down by Ubadallah's army. Hussein requested to be allowed to return to Mecca, while Ubadallah demanded Hussein's surrender and pledge his loyalty to Yazid. When Hussein refused, the Umayyad forces surrounded Hussein's party, cutting them off from the water to force their surrender. When this too failed, the surrounding army attacked on October 10, 680, killing Hussein and his supporters in a hopelessly unequal struggle. The battle had been short, and its outcome little in doubt, but the killing of Hussein, the Prophet's grandson, would shock the Muslim world, with the date of the battle immortalized by Shia Muslims as a day of mourning and Karbala as a pilgrimage site. Galvanized by Hussein's martyrdom, major revolts led by Abdullah would arise in Mecca and Medina in the following years, with Yazid's experienced Syrian forces under Muslim ibn Uqba inflicting defeats on the rebels but failing to regain the loyalty of the populace. The siege and bombardment of the holy city of Mecca itself in 683 only created further outrage, with Yazid dying the same year under unexplained circumstances. His son and successor, the sickly Muawiyah II, would rule only a few months before abdicating, leaving an empty throne and a caliphate divided once more. Ash Why did he abdicate? I'm guessing with, with the civil war that's happening, he probably looked at it like if I abdicate, I'll just live a normal life instead of being hunted down and possibly killed. Or he just didn't want it to begin with. Bring in the second fitna. The years to follow would see numerous figures claim the caliphate. In the Hejaz, Abdullah ibn Zubayr was acclaimed caliph with a majority of the Muslim world initially backing him. Ubaidallah ibn Ziyad, the general who had martyred Hussein at Karbala, established a power base in Basra and briefly claimed the caliphate as well, but failed to win the same widespread support and was soon driven from Basra by an uprising of Karajites. And in Syria, the only region still loyal to the Umayyad dynasty, Muawiyah II was eventually succeeded by Marwan, Caliph Uthman's secretary and cousin with Yazid's young but popular son Khalid being sidelined. Abaidallah would return to Umayyad's service after the failure of his own bid for power, seizing 8 million dirhams from Basra's treasury before he fled, and would lead Marwan's armies in the coming struggle. Treasure. Okay. 
so many people just revolting and dying and... Marwan's first challenge in defeating the more popular Abdullah was to secure his hold over Syria against a powerful foe uncomfortably close to home, Dahaki bin Qais, the governor of Damascus province, who had loyally served Muawiyah during the first fitna, even leading his infantry at Sifin, but had now defected to Abdullah in opposition to the Umayyads, bringing much of Syria with him. Marwan did have several major advantages, Khaled, though some oh. fighting broke out. Sorry. Khaled. It's not the Khaled I'm thinking of. But in the Sorry. streets, after Dahak and the young Umayyad prince, Khalid ibn Yazid, each delivered speeches in favor of their faction during the leading of prayers, the Umayyads retained control of the city of Damascus itself, and by extension, the vast treasury of the Caliphate, <laughs> allowing Marwan to win the loyalty of many local tribes through bribery. Dahak also retained some degree of loyalty to the dynasty he'd served so long, even briefly returning to Umayyad service after negotiating with Khalid and Abaidallah, making him a rather reluctant and indecisive opponent, spurred on only by pressure from his overwhelmingly anti-Umayyad supporters in the Qaisi tribal confederation. Even so, Dahak and the Qaisi were able to amass a sizable army of 20,000 or more at Maj Rahit, at the edge of the desert to the east of Damascus, joined by supporters from across Syria. Marwan, on the advice of Abai Dalla, gathered his own loyalists from the Kalb Confederation and from the remnants of the once powerful Ghassanids and rode out to challenge him, with the two armies meeting on July 29, 684. With his own supporters numbering some 6,000, Marwan was outnumbered greatly by Dahak's forces. Nevertheless, his infantry-heavy army was able to hold firm over the course of 19 days of raiding and skirmishing from Dahak's largely mounted force. Marwan's left was commanded by Abaidallah and his right by Amr ibn Said, also known as al Ashdak, an Umayyad clansman whose ambitions would lead him to attempt his own grab for the throne in the years following. Dahak gave command of his right to Zayd ibn Amr, with other notable commanders, including Thawa ibn Man of the Banu Salaim, on whose insistence Dahak had finally broken from the Umayyads. On August 18th, the fighting grew fiercer and the skirmishing gave way to charges and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Despite coming from so many disparate groups, the morale and discipline of Marwan's forces won out, with his hard-pressed infantry weathering numerous disorganized attacks until a mighty champion from among the Kul, named Zana ibn Abdallah, slew Dahak in the midst of a heated melee. Neither side at first realized the governor had fallen, with Zanah throwing himself back into the fray, unaware of the victory he had won. But another soldier, marveling at the warrior's prowess, soon discovered Dahak's body and returned his head to Marwan. Despite still holding a numerical advantage, the Abdullah loyalists quickly dissolved after their leader's defeat, the cavalry of the various tribes under Dahak's banner melting away and returning home or swearing obedience to Marwan. Many battles still lay ahead for the Umayyads, even with Syria now firmly in their grasp. Most of the Caliphate still recognized Abdullah as Caliph, and as the Second Fitna drew on, more factions and challenges would arise to complicate the struggle for the throne. But with his victory at Maj Rahit, Marwan had rescued his dynasty from the edge of total defeat, and with the armies of Syria and the treasury of the Caliphate behind him, he now stood poised to reclaim the empire Yazid had lost. In our next episode on the early Muslim expansion... There's just so much, so many names and, and so many... Sometimes it's just hard to keep up. But it's never short on death, <laughs> I'll tell you that. In all these, in all the Muslim expansion videos, I'm just curious how many people I've seen die. <laughs> it's a lot. All right, I'm gonna end this here. Um, you need to like and subscribe, otherwise. And I, I sh I don't want to say this because it's inappropriate. But you're gonna wake up, and you're gonna have a mole on your on your like forearm, and it's gonna turn out to be peanut butter. You're gonna have peanut butter cancer. It just it just grows, and then once it gets so big, people just they take it off.
with their finger and they put it on bread. Peanut butter cancer, it's real. Yep. <laughs>